We welcome all of our new online listeners. Hi, my name is Dr. Stephen Finney, the hosting pastor of XL Church in IOM America. XL represents Exchange Life. Our church is an outreach of IOM America. Everything we do sits upon the pedestal of compassion. So let's get started. Enjoy the worship, illustrative videos, prayer, and weekly message. Psalm 22 verse 3 promises that God will be enthroned on the praises of His people. I just want to be where you are Dwelling daily in your presence I don't want to worship from afar Draw me near to where you are I just want to be where you are In your dwelling place In your dwelling place Take me to the place where you are Cause I just want to be with you I want to be where you are Dwelling in your presence Feasting at your table And surrounded by your glory in your presence That's where I always want to be I just want to be I just want to be with you I just want to be where you are Dwelling daily in your presence Dwelling daily I don't want to worship from afar Draw me near Draw me near to where you are Oh my God You are my strength and my song And when I'm in your presence Though I'm weak, you're always strong I just want to be your dwelling place forever in your dwelling place forever take me to the place take me to, to the, the place, place where you are cause I just want to be I just want to be with you I just want I just want to be with you. Oh God, that's our prayer. We want to be where you are, dwelling in your presence, feasting at your table, and surrounded by your glory. Oh, that's our prayer, God. We want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence Feasting at your table Surrounded by your glory Surrounded by your glory In your presence, Lord That's where we always want to be I just want to be I just want to be with you. Make it your prayer tonight. I just want to be. I just want to be with you. Oh God, that's our prayer. We want to be where you are. I just want to.
God, we want to be there. Surrounded by your glory. Dwelling daily in your presence. Eschatology, unfolding the power of prophecy. Welcome to our 220 Revelation series. Today we're on number 43. The title is The Seventh Angel Sounds. The sounding of the seventh trumpet makes a significant milestone in the book of Revelation. It sets in motion the final events leading up to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the establishment of his earthly millennial kingdom as King of Kings during the 1,000 years of judgment. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. That mystery is the full revelation of the consummation of God's plan. We are slowly but for surely moving into discovering what those final plans are all about. It was prophesied by the Old Testament preachers, but its fullness was never revealed until, of course, the book of Revelation. That the seven bold judgments which represents the final outpouring of God's wrath, are certainly included within the seventh trumpet, which is what we find in Revelation chapter 15, verse 1. And it says, everything that we need to know about this bowl of wrath. The last three of these seven trumpet judgments are so horrific that they are referred to as woes. If you remember back in chapter 8, verse 13, John said, I heard an eagle flying in the mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell upon the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Today we're going to be discussing the sounding of that seventh trumpet. But first, let's take a look at our passage for today. It says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged. And the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who feared your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God which is in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds of perils of thunder, and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. 
That's out of Revelation chapter 11, but let's talk about all the seals being revealed. As you can tell, we have the resumption of the trumpets and their assigned judgments. The bride of Christ is safe in the arms of Jesus and is being seated in the front row to watch the grand finale. By this time, God has removed all the seals from the seven-sealed book that holds the redemptive guidelines for all who lived, past and present. This truly is a significant moment. All of God's design is about to be released from the curse he placed on the earth in the garden. When the seventh and final angel steps up, there's quite a stir in heaven as well as on the earth. John, our writer, hears a great voice, stirring the hearts of all who are in heaven, ready to make the announcement. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Let's review Satan's 6,000 years coming to an end. Satan and his followers have been in power for, yes, 6,000 years. But now the time has come when God will take over the heavens and the earth as one unit. According to Psalms 24 verse 1, it tells us that he will come and take back what is rightfully his. This is that time. The Lord of Lords is about to take his seat on his throne, according to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And of course, it's mentioned again in Luke chapter 1, verse 32. He will come to sit on his throne in the third temple, which presently, by the way, sits under the Dome of the Rock, which creates a political issue. The earth's curse is temporarily removed for the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ and his judgments. That rock has been placed right smack dab in the middle of God's holy of holy place. It's been the holy place since the time of King David's rule. While Satan is chained in the pit for this thousand years, there will be temporary peace on earth. The reason? God restrains the curse on the earth by restraining Satan himself. The great deceiver will have zero access to the people, thus removing temptation and deception. God does this to clear the minds of those who are about to go through judgment. No excuses and no lies, because Satan has been literally chained up and placed in the pit during the thousand years of Christ's judgment. In verse 16 of this passage, we discover the 24 elders falling on their faces and worshiping God. They each cry out, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which are to come, because you have taken to you your great power and have reigned. Well, if you remember, the first coming of Christ was in the form of a tender little lamb. But the second coming, as described in Revelation, he will come in great power, fire in his eyes, a drawn sword, and taking vengeance on all those who insulted his beloved bride, the true spirit indwelt believers. He will come forth like a roaring lion, and this is why he is called the Lion of Judah. In reviewing the ungodly and the unrighteous being blown away by this event, we finally get to see the picture from the book of Revelation what this judgment looks like. We approach the climactical relevant affairs of the ungodly and unrighteous servants of Satan the time has come when the ungodly must be like the chaff, who will be separated from the seeds of righteousness, authentic believers. 
During the thousand-year judgment, God will separate and then blow the chaff unbelievers into hell by way of the Holy Spirit. As odd as it sounds, unbelievers are truly like chaff, around believers, true seeds. The oddity is that chaff is used to protect the seed until harvest. Then separation is needed and the chaff is burned. That is the exact parallel of what is going to happen to the earth, Satan and all of his followers after judgment is complete. Psalms 1 verses 4 through 6 explains this process quite bluntly. It says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the winds drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment or sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Again, that's out of Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. The cool thing about Revelation, it knits the entire Bible verse by verse into the conclusion of God's divine purpose for his creation. He even uses the chaff, the devil and his followers, to accomplish his great purposes. Think about the chaff being used to cover the seeds so that the seeds will grow. How is that for all things working together for good? Speaking of righteous judgment, the righteous judgment that is about to follow the sounding of the seventh and final trumpet is by far the most intense, the most earth-shattering, the most remarkable, and the most significant contained within the Word of God. This trumpet call puts all things in its final order. Remember when God used his mighty power to deliver Israel out of the land of Egypt and led them back home to their God and their promised land? There were breathtaking wonders in the air, the waters, the trees, the rocks. Remember that rock that spilled forth water? The clouds? God used every element of creation to speak favor to his children. There are so many miracles and marvels that he used to make his point throughout the scriptures. Yet neither of these, nor the combination of all of them, can compare to the happenings that occur after the sounding of the seventh trumpet. When the angel sounds his trumpet, John declares that he heard great voices. These aren't just voices. These sounds will be compared to many waters, great thunder, or the flutter of mighty angels with a voice. These voices will be heard throughout the entire universe. Angels are shouting for the final fall of the final Babylon. Others will be shouting blessings to the dead that died in the Lord, and then others that call upon the name of Jesus. But notably, it will be a great voice that will trouble the ungodly. After this concludes, one final voice cries. It is done. We need to take a look at the bowl of wrath. Most Christians don't realize what the bowl of wrath is. The best way to explain this bowl is to view how God stored up his wrath in one single vessel patiently waiting for the blast of the seventh trumpet. Then, revenge. He dumps his entire wrath of 6,000 years at one time on Satan and his followers. 
I can assure you it will be an unmeasurable amount of wrath. Looking back over Revelation chapter 5, Jesus took the seven-sealed book from the hand of him that sits on the throne. If you remember, there was quite a commotion in heaven when this took place. His action back then was the beginning of the fulfillment of the redemption of all of creation. When our groom Jesus was found worthy to open the book, he took it and began removing the seals one by one. The seventh seal is found under the last of the seven seals. From the moment that our groom took this book until now, we have reviewed the unfolding judgments of God. Each seal opened, bringing much excitement and anticipation. But when the seventh trumpet sounds, everything in heaven and all of creation breaks out with shouts of praise. Amen. The act that all have anticipated is, of course, revenge. Likened to a runner moments away from crossing the finish line, amid this excitement, the elders are still quite concerned about things to come. They know that the enemy of the earth, Satan, and man are not yet silenced. They certainly know that the great white throne of judgment is ahead. They realize that the rewards to all the faithful have not yet been handed out to the faithful servants. Bottom line is, Satan remains free to roam on the earth. He has not been contained. Therefore, the victory of victories is yet to be shouted. The shout that shall ring throughout eternity, the day God's vengeance is applied. Talking about the blasting out of the shout, with the angel placing his lips upon the mouthpiece of the trumpet. The elders eagerly await the final announcement of judgment. With the blast, they are all falling out of their thrones and falling prostrate on their faces before the Lamb of God. While this happens, the nations of the earth are angered beyond anger. In Revelation it says, And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who feared your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. Here's what we have to look forward to. A new heaven, new earth, the saints put on display in the pearly white city, and Satan will be put in the pit of hell. All sin and all unrighteousness must be removed from the earth by placing it within the earth. The Antichrist and the unrighteous will be put in their proper place. Due to this, they become consumed by their self-indulged anger, which provokes the great war that will break out between God and Satan. That's in Revelation chapter 12, and that's the beginning references of the Battle of Armageddon. In verse 19, we discover that the temple of God is open. In chapter 11, verse 19, it says, And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds of pearls of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. Fact is, the tabernacle and the Jewish temple were replicas of the actual tabernacle in heaven according to Exodus 25, verse 40. All of the elements of God's creation are replicas or made in the likeness of heaven. He gave us natural things to understand supernatural. The facts are, what is to be done on earth is done in heaven. When God opens the doors to the temple, John immediately sees the Ark of God's Covenant as in the case of the 
first promise covenant, Noah's Ark. The covenant's original Ark is revealed. All of the covenants and promises of the living God to his people are in the Ark, the eternal Ark, in heaven. God's perfect and complete promises cannot be broken. Not one promise of God is broken or ever has been broken. All of his engagements, his appointments with the chosen are in this box, each stored safely and tenderly preserved under the hand of God for this hour. Since God cannot lie, all of this box's content will come to pass. Satisfaction guaranteed. The time has come for all promises of God to be delivered. The Ark study of the Old Testament helps reveal the Ark of Heaven and its not-so-hidden meaning and treasures. God's blessings and presence go hand in hand with the first Ark and the last. Wherever the Ark went, God went. Rivers rolled back, walls fell, and enemies scattered because of it. So why did the Ark of the Covenant disappear? After the death of Christ, the temple transition had to occur. Transferring the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence, to that of the Bride of Christ. This is why we as authentic believers are referenced as the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Ark now lives in those indwelt by Jesus Christ. Looking at our little pictorial there, as you know, it all started with Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark was the very first symbol that God gave us of the Ark of the Covenant. God's presence literally was within that Noah's Ark, and it is God's presence that preserved them and saved them from the destruction upon the earth. Not long after that, he established the tabernacle by way of a tent, if you remember, when Moses was with them in the wilderness. Not long after that, Solomon's temple was built, and his presence was moved to the Holy of Holies within that temple. And this is the way things were during the time of Jesus walking on the face of the earth. Then the temple transition took place. God allowed the destruction of Solomon's temple so that the Spirit, the presence of God, would indwell the human heart. This is where we get the idea, the concept, and the truth of how important it is for authentic believers to receive the indwelling life of Jesus Christ by way of the Holy Spirit. Now those who are indwelt by the living God through Christ Jesus by way of the Holy Spirit as scripture tells us, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The heavenly ark announces the fulfillment of all that God has promised regarding the earth, judgment, the righteous, and of course all of creation. Certainly God must have thought this was a significant announcement due to his appointed sound effects. Flashes of lightning, sounds of piles of thunder, earthquakes, and a great hailstorm. I can hardly wait for chapter 12. Coming up next in number 44, we're going to be talking about the woman Israel. Well, in Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. The first personage to be described is the woman of Revelation. She is being defined under extraordinary terms and manner. She's clothed with the sun as she stands on the moon. For her headdress is crowned, studded with twelve stars, and is in tremendous pain and is ready to give birth 
to the Lord's holy justice. Why would God use such a parallel as this? The only way we can come close to understanding this personage is to compare spiritual things with spiritual things, allowing God's word to tell us what all these supposed symbols mean. Well, you're just going to have to join us in this powerful message in our next episode. Again, thank you for joining us. We look forward to reconnecting with you in our next message. Until next time.